Prize winner Marie Curie once famously said, nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. More than a hundred years later, we fear much less because of scientific discoveries, and yet the need to understand the world better is ever more compelling. What is the international environment we're looking at? What is the scale of scientific divide? Is it getting better? What are the enabling factors propelling scientific progress and scientific awareness? And what is the role of media in the whole picture? Welcome to part one of Science Matters, a special program brought to you by The Point on CGTN in collaboration with the Chinese Society of Science and Technology Journalism, brought to you from the National Convention Center here in Beijing. My name is Liu Xin, and I would like to welcome to you a distinguished panel of guests present today with me. They are Professor Lloyd Davis, a steward professor of science communication in the Center for Science Communication at the University of Otago in New Zealand, Dr. Zhou Zhonghe, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Chen Xiaowei, co-founder of Wisnut, a platform providing solutions to small and medium-sized enterprises. Dr. Peter Dashak, president of EcoHealth Alliance, a U.S.-based organization that conducts research and outreach programs on global health. And Jason Socrates Bardi, news director at the American Institute of Physics. The warmest welcome to all of you. And of course, the warmest welcome to all our audience members present today with us. Before we start the discussion, let's take a look at this video first. How pivotal is this point in history? China sent world's first quantum communication satellite into space. SpaceX launched world's most powerful rocket. Google's AI beat world's best Go player. Is technology leading us to a better future, or creating a more dangerous world? Human head transplant, controversial procedure. A self-driving car killed a pedestrian for the first time. Facebook data scandal. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. How is technology changing relations between people and countries? What does it mean to be human in a tech-dominated world? As countries compete in the tech race, what steps are the leaders taking to keep their edge? Well, it's uh, some um, very profound questions to think about. But let's look at the news first. And uh, the most recent headlines, when it comes to science, uh, do not sound very reassuring. Rather, quite. Worrying. Um, we know that in the United States, U.S. President Donald Trump has、uh, implied that every Chinese student could be a spy.、Uh, they have talked about Chinese companies being the tools for the Chinese government. They have talked about、uh, Chinese scientists who, re who receive support from the state as、uh, also being suspected for to、uh, as tools for the Chinese government to steal information and innovation from. The United States.、Um, I know it's very daunting, but it is really true. The FBI director Christopher Wray went on national TV to say that uh, the um, Chinese uh, community is the biggest intelligence threat to the U.S. and foreign companies that are beholden to foreign governments that do not share our values and our dedication to the rule of law、uh, enables them to conduct、uh, economic espionage. So,、uh, Dr. Dashak, let me go to you first. What does this mean to the scientific community in the United States? Are we really looking at a very worrying environment? Well, I, I think that the rhetoric of the politics doesn't reflect the science that I see.、Um, our organisation has been working 
in China with, in collaboration with Chinese scientists in the government of China for over 15 years, supported by federal funding from the US and federal funding from China. And this true global cooperation, we work on emerging diseases ever since the SARS virus emerged in China. It's been a, a key issue for public health. Um, I, I think that when there's a big issue that threatens us all, we come together, um, whatever nation we're in, and we try and deal with it. Science has always been a way of doing that international diplomacy. And it's, I don't like the discussion of intellectual property mixed in with a trade war discussion. It's, it's very dis disconcerting to me. But it also doesn't reflect what I see on the ground. Um, the work we do with Chinese collaborators is published jointly in international journals. Um, the sequence data is uploaded onto the internet, free for everyone to read. Very open, very transparent, and very collaborative. And that's the nature with which we do science these days. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zhou, uh, yeah. you must have been reading the news and watching the news. What are your reaction to such headlines? Well, I'm a, a paleontologist. I'm basically working on something that's a, a very basic science. That's probably unlike some other scientific disciplines that's more or less related to technical or innovations. So we don't see any impact on these kind of things, but uh, nobody knows. Who knows? Politicians, they are making dis decisions sometimes not uh, based on scientific judgments, they're based on the poor. So in my point, uh, all basic science is uh, international, uh, universal. So I, in my opinion, scientific community are always the strongest supporter of international uh, globalization, mm -hmm. in particular in scientific collaborations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Badi, from your observation, do you feel uh, a kind of wall is being built somewhere by some people, by some forces, to separate scientists uh, from different countries? Well, I like to look at things very positively, and I think that um, my experience uh, studying science, going to graduate school in the United States, and I think the experience of most Americans who have gone to graduate school in science in the last 20 years has been that the labs are very international places, they're small UNs. Um, it was my experience, and I think a lot of people have the experience where, as an American, you're actually in the minority in, in, the, in the lab. Most of the people are from other countries. Um, I work at the American Institute of Physics, which is a publisher. Um, we have authors from all over the world, probably uh, the largest group of authors, uh, if, not the, if not the largest, is here in China. Um, I have interviewed and written stories about Chinese scientists um, working abroad, working here in China. So f from my perspective, uh, uh, this, is, this is noise, or at least I hope it is, that, that, that when it comes down to actually doing science, um, making advances that help uh, humanity that help the world that we are um, one global planet and that we work together. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Davis, your job is to communicate right, science to the general public. Do you feel uh, in terms of cross-cultural communication between scientists of different countries, do you think it's, it's an act of goodwill or is an, act, is an obligation, is a responsibility for, for the scientific community? I, th I think it's probably both. I think that um, as scientists, we are mostly funded by the public, uh, and that creates a responsibility, I think, uh, to not only um, work for the benefit of the society you live in, but the global society. And on the other hand, I would concur with what's been said by the other panelists, that as a community, scientists uh, I think very global, very understanding. I recently edited a book uh, called Science Diplomacy, uh, New Dawn, uh, or, or, and the thing is that science can be used for nefarious reasons. I mean, we've all been through the Cold War and things like that, but even during those times, it was scientists reaching out to other scientists from different countries, and we face a world in which we have problems that can only be solved with global solutions, only by countries cooperating. And I think the, 
the big hope for the world is that there will be more science diplomacy that the politicians, unlike the one that you mentioned, um, will take on board the need for cooperation. Mm -hmm. Xiao Wei, uh, how do you look at the negative uh, implications of uh, such policy or such tendency um, for countries like the United States and other developed countries who might follow suit, we do not know, who might follow suit and, and start looking at things in this negative way? Well, I'm only very glad that I went to the United States um, to graduate school at a much more peaceful time. Um, I feel for my, my alumni, many of them went to the United States, went to graduate school in sciences, and remained there um, as researchers, and also uh, researchers in industry and academia. I feel for them. This is not an easy time for them. So I definitely concur with all scientists here as our guests um, who said that science takes a global solution. It takes collaboration. So I'm hoping that this trade war mushroom cloud will blow over soon and uh, global communication in science would resume. Hopefully. Uh, I think the fact that the United States or other developed countries that have been doing so well in terms of uh, scientific progress and innovation uh, is precisely because of the open-mindedness that they have been embracing. And yet, um, we have to acknowledge that we are seeing some worrying trends. Um, whether or not these trends will really turn into policy, we do not know. The latest news is that in a letter made public, uh, Professor Frank Collins, who is head of the National Institute of Health, he asked actually requested his colleagues, tens of thousands of colleagues across the United States to scrutinize the, um, the background of uh, applicants and, uh, and uh, progress reports on their uh, research support, on their financial interests and relevant affiliations and to reach out to the local FBI bureaus to brief them on such matter. I mean, um, there are politics all the time, but uh, it seems that and for many uh, critics, for scientists to, to take the lead in, in initiating this kind of restriction instead of resisting it, it seems quite unusual. Dr. Dashak, what is your take? The good news is that in the U.S., um, public funding for science, certainly for health science and um, basic sciences, is judged not politically, but it's judged by other scientists. We get peer review of our grants. And I don't think that as we go into those peer review forums, and I've sat on many of them, that we're going to see these sorts of questions be actually played out in the decisions on funding. Those decisions that are judged by fellow scientists then go to program officers within the agencies who are also independent of political um, influence. So I'm, I don't think this is going to come to anything. I really don't. I, I, I feel very positive about, about this time on our planet when global issues like emerging diseases, um, pandemics, climate change are being dealt with by such international consortia of scientists. Mm -hmm. They're unprecedented times with unprecedented collaboration. I don't see that changing. Mm -hmm. Dr. Joe, maybe uh, you can explain to our uh, audiences abroad in the United States, for instance, uh, what is this national project called the Thousand Talent Plan? What is China wanting to do here? I think uh, there is a general mistrust toward anything that's uh, promoted by the Chinese state. Yeah, I think uh, we're, uh, we got to understand this in two different ways. On the one hand, I think science and, uh, uh, has no national boundaries. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, all scientists belong to a community. Some of the community are in a, a particular country or society or area. Uh, it's understandable that, that the scientists in that particular group they take some responsibility for uh, serving the country or the, or the area because you uh, got supported by, by the society. But on the other hand, all all scientific activity are actually uh, very globally uh, interconnected. So this got to be a kind of a balance. I mean, I think in the past this has been just going very well, right? Uh, we understand this. Uh, we need more international collaboration among scientists from uh, community uh, everywhere in the world. I think uh, overall this is good for the progress of science. and. Uh, also, I mean, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, I, I understand that the, the, the progress of science has played uh, even more and more important role in 
uh, economic and social progress at this at this time. So it's got becoming becoming uh, more and more competitive. Mm -hmm. So many countries attach to uh, more importance to scientific right. progress. So the competition for talents it become uh, also more obvious. So the Chinese government, because the Chinese has a tradition of uh, a slower beginning of economic growth, uh, so we need lots of uh, trained uh, international trained scientists. Sure. So this is an understandable. Mm -hmm. How do you look at the fact that actually um, in March this year the United States surpassed the largest uh, um, increase in their R&D funding in a decade? I mean, people were talking about you know, Chinese government putting a very strong hand behind uh, scientific uh, upgrading, upgrading, but actually the United States is doing much more than that. Dr. Darshak, do you have any comments? Well, look, I'm delighted when there's more funding for basic research, for applied research, for all science. I think e even in the US where we fund science very well, um, we still, as a, in the general public and in society, we don't really respect science and scientists to the level at which we benefit from their work. Um, you know, that said, there is something else in the US that, that's also very useful, and that's the rapidity with which the science can be turned into a product, can be put out on the market, and that R&D can be transformed into a business. And the very competitive nature of the US business um, e economy helps push science forwards. And I think that's really what we, we need to um, focus on, is the interaction between government funding and then what actually becomes translated into products on the market that benefit health mm -hmm. and well-being around the world. Mm -hmm. Talking about R&D, let's take a look at some charts. We actually have prepared some uh, uh, data to indicate the comparative levels of uh, R&D investments from different countries. Um, we are looking at... Uh, the blue line is uh, representing the United States, meaning they have the largest R&D investment in the world, and uh, by that I mean the government, the academia, and private sector put together. So that's very impressive, and these numbers are coming from the OECD Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. We can see the green line is China. China is second since five years, but uh, the pace is picking up. Uh, it is followed by Japan and uh, Germany and South Korea, and their investment have uh, stayed relatively stable. Um, but let me look, let us look at the second chart. Don't turn around yet. Let's look at the second chart, and this is the uh, R&D in terms of percentage of the GDP, and here we see uh, quite a remarkable difference there. South Korea has over 3.8 percent of their GDP uh, invested into R&D and China is lagging behind in all the five countries with uh, just above uh, about 1 to 2 percent of their GDP invested in R&D. So people are saying this is called R&D intensity. Um, shall we? Um, what is the implication of having a relatively low R&D intensity for China's scientific and technological development? Well, um, I think that the trend overall for China is still going up. And China is catching up in terms of absolute dollar amount uh, with the United States. And that's good. Um, in terms of percentage of GDP, I think China not only lags um, behind in R&D, but in a lot of area, in healthcare, in education. Um, and when I was in the movie business, um, China's uh, uh, spending in the movie business was still, uh, in terms of percentage of GDP, was behind. So I, don't, I, I wouldn't take too much of that into account, but the first chart, I think, is a very good trend. The question is whether um, more of that is in, from industry or from government. Um, I, I personally would think that we need to watch, um, we, we would like to see more funding from the government because the government funding pushes science more than technology, which is pushed more by industry. And technology without science is a tree without root. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bardi, what is your opinion here? Would you like to see more government funding or more private sector funding in, in this matter? Well, I think you need both. Um, clearly, uh, the government is going to fund a lot of basic research that would not necessarily be funded um, by industry without the, 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 the government's uh, portfolio. 
um, and you know maybe high risk research and that's the reason why government is more likely to fund basic research is is that um, it may not pan out but we learn things in the process and then we you know it goes in a direction that we weren't expecting um, over the long term I think that there have been studies to show the investment in basic research pays off you know many fold um, and if anyone knows the particular no numbers, I, I, I would defer to that. I don't know it off the top of my head, but um, but clearly, you 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 know, having strong investment in basic research by governments is a good thing for science mm -hmm. and for humanity. Yeah. Dr. Dashatka, um, does the increasing amount of R&D investment necessarily lead to a higher um, or greater edge in terms of scientific and technological I, development? I think that, that's the key question. You know, th these figures are very interesting actually and um, maybe there, there is something more to this, that, that it's the interaction between the basic research and then how rapidly that's supplied and, and used in business that matters. You know, it, it gets to the heart of this issue around intellectual property and open collaboration, transparency. Science is, is naturally transparent and open. That's, that's the way scientists have always operated. You do something, you discover something, you want to tell the world about it. That's the nature of a scientist. The nature of a company is you make a discovery, you want to make some money out of it, and your competitors might take that. And I think that's, that's actually a useful interaction. The way those two sides interact together in, in a country like the US is really important. Um, you know, it's good to get open science and collaboration, and then it's also good for com different companies in the U.S. to compete, to mm. make money out of that. Mm. When it translates to the international scene, it becomes more complicated, but it's still essentially the same thing. The, the competitive advantage to a business is how you translate the basic science, not whether or not you did that basic science. And that's why I think this I IP issue is... Um, is overblown and hyperbole right now. I think we're still in a good place with what we're doing internationally with science. Mm -hmm. Dr. Joe, what is uh, more funding meaning for your discipline? Uh, would you like to see that and uh, will it help your research? Uh, I would like to focus on my discipline. That's small discipline uh, in every country. So I, I would let's say to you that the increase of uh, IND is always welcome in every country. I think that's good. The reason, as I said before, I think uh, science is uh, playing a more and more important role, is contributing more to the uh, development of the society. And uh, actually, I was, I was excited to see the first chart. I think uh, China is, uh, in fact, in the past five years, really increasing its uh, uh, IND very rapidly. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's uh, very exciting. And uh, I was kind of uh, uh, had a very uh, more or less a complex feeling for the second chart. See the 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 ratio of the IND increase uh, as a percentage of uh, uh, for GDP is is not not as high as other uh, developed countries. But uh, for me, I think. Uh, uh, there are more issues to worry about in China because uh, how to use the money more efficiently. Mm. We need to uh, put more efforts on how to make the system more efficiently, yeah. to not, not to waste the money of the taxpayers. So. Sure. So two things after the blockade, the, the so-called blockade of uh, ZTE, uh, which wake, uh, woken up a lot of Chinese people and maybe the Chinese leadership as, as well as to the, the urgent need to spearhead China's basic research and, and, and scientific and, and uh, technological progress in key sectors. Shall we? do you foresee in the next uh, in the near future that China's R&D spending is even going to shoot up faster. Do you foresee that? Absolutely. I think overall for basic research as well as technology development for China, it's a very good thing because for years Chinese companies and their founders have been making money purely on applications or even innovation in business model. Now we really need to think about the basics. And so this is a good thing. Yeah, but what would be the biggest challenge? Even with a lot of money spent, do you think China will necessarily become the scientific and technological powerhouse? Because there are estimates that by 2022, China will become the world's number one investor in R&D. Do you think China's standing in R&D ability will, will also reach number one by then? 
I, I don't know. I'm not involved in policy making, but China may increase its R&D. But I think 2020 is only two years away. Um, with China becoming, say, the lead technology innovator in the world in two years, I think that that's a bit unrealistic. However, I think we, there's a lot Chinese scientists and um, researchers can do mm -hmm. in continuing to consolidate the foundation. Right now, China is suffering from a lack of historic foundation of R&D. Dr. Dashak, you were talking about the important uh, relationship between public and private investment in R&D. According to the EU R&D scoreboard, that uh, in 2016 and 17, Chinese company Huawei ranks among the world's top 10 investor in R&D in 2016. How important is it uh, for the private sector to invest in there? And uh, how can they balance the relationship between making money and funding basic research? Yeah, I think th that's a really tough question for the private sector. I'm sure the return on investment from R&D is critical, but there's always a time lag. And I think that the problem is, with, you see, with some companies, especially new companies that suddenly go public and do very well in their IPO and then, then run into problems later on, is the, the time lag between the amazing new discoveries they're, they're in the process of, of turning into profit and, and the fact that they're running low on cash as they go through that. So that it's got to be done well and it's got to be managed correctly. Now I'm not a businessman but I'm, I've seen this happen and I've seen this affect uh, companies' stock prices over the years um, just because of the lo lack of confidence as they spend more and more money in R&D and don't translate that into profit. So for a for-profit sector it's a tough challenge but it's critical mm -hmm. okay we're going to leave uh, the discussion on this topic here and uh, you have been watching a special edition of the point with me Liu Xin coming to you from the national convention center in Beijing as usual you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter using the handle the point with LX download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN the point thanks for watching see you next time The Chinese education mm -hmm. has, to some extent, has cured, not, not, a, not, not a cultivated the curiosity mm -hmm. of students. The Western philosophy is science-based. The Chinese philosophy is wisdom-based. By 2020 in New Zealand, there will be no subjects, no science subjects, perhaps biology, but probably not. Scientists as heroes, not just because they're charismatic, because often they are, but because of the incredible amount of work they've done to find out that nugget of information.